I suppose status update, league is over. Uh, how has it been from a memory point of view? Uh, what's been your general takeaways from it all? Yeah, I think it's been a great league, to be honest. Um, we've, we've had a couple of, I suppose, mixed results. Um, but I think our performances have been have been kind of trending in the right direction. Um, look, realistically speaking, yes, we've had a couple of losses, but that's not always a, it's not always a terrible thing during the league, you know. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world to have a loss or to to, um, to or yeah to have a loss that you can kind of reflect on and see where you went wrong, um, see what we can improve on things like that. I suppose it's kind of nice. Well, it's not nice, but it's. It's not the worst thing in the world to have a loss so early in the year, you know, one that's not going to have a huge impact um, on the championship going forward. You know, it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice to have a couple of key areas to, to identify to, that you need to work on um, following the loss, you know. So uh, I've talked about failure in the past and how failure shouldn't always be a negative thing. So I suppose in real life, in real life circumstances, then when you do have a loss, especially in the league, it's not, not the end of the world, you know, once you learn from it. And from your own point of view, we've seen you off the bench a lot. How has that been for you? Uh, well, I actually picked up. I picked up a bit of an injury after the Galway game. Um, that kept me out of the of the, the Waterford game and the Cork game, and came off the bench yesterday. So I was, I was kind of, I was mad to get back on the field yesterday. But it was such a nice day above in, above in Cusick Park in Westmead and Mullingar. Um, so I was mad for road yesterday. So I'm, I'm back training out the last week or two. So. As I said, hopefully looking forward to championship in a couple of weeks, and um, there'll be we'll have obviously fairly competitive next two weeks in training, trying to trying to get on the trying to get on the team. So it's kind of it's kind of funny. You normally have a nice break to after the league. You might have a week off, and then four or five weeks leading into championship. Whereas obviously this time around, we have two and a half weeks kind of from now. Um, so yeah, training will be important over the next couple of weeks, as you can imagine. What was the nature of that knock you got? Uh, it's a bit of a, I had a groin injury, kind of. I, it was not. It was nothing. It was nothing. I can't remember when it happened, uh, but I was fairly, I was fairly sore the day Monday and Tuesday after the Galway game, and um, yeah, it just took a bit of time to, to. I just took my time rehabbing it and making sure when I came back. In fairness, the lads looked after me, making sure that when I do come back, I was right because, as you can imagine, if you get another, if you come back too soon and then get another little knock. And you have another two or three week injury, then you're kind of nearly out of the first round of the championship, and it's kind of hard to get back into the team. Then so, um, so yeah, that was it. It was not major. Uh, finally, for me, for now, you mentioned you know it'll be uh, an interesting couple of weeks in training. Um, John is obviously uh, you know given a lot of guys chances in the league, and I mean it was already a competitive panel, but it will be fairly ferocious. That you probably have one good uh, hit out at each other for the next week in training before you sell down for Cork. So. There will be guys trying to put their hands up, won't there? Yeah, and there has, and that's the, beauty, that's the beauty of this year's league, that there has been a lot of lads that have put up their hands. Um, and I suppose we'll have probably uh, we'll probably have a game maybe this weekend between ourselves. Um, and obviously, they do put a huge emphasis on training and how fellas are going in training. And it is a, a bit of a meritocracy in Limerick that if the lads that are training the best are playing the best in training games or playing the best in the games, we'll get the starting jersey in a couple of weeks' time. So as I said... It, it will be it will be a very uh, interesting and demanding couple of weeks of training, but that's that's what we're in for. Thanks, Joe. Hey, hey, hey bro. How are you doing? How's it going? Um, Crow, there's been a lot of talk about freeze this year and how easy it is to get a free. Do you, do you would you agree with that? Um, there has been a lot of talk about um, free counts and referees uh, since the start of the league this year and I think at the start of the league it was it was much more it was much more um, prevalent I suppose the, the number of frees that were me given in the in the early league games compared to maybe towards the end of the league I would imagine I would assume this isn't anything uh, this isn't a fact but I would say that the free count Early on in the league was definitely higher than it was later on in the league. So I do believe that referees, look, they were under the spotlight and there was so much scrutiny being put on them um, in what is already a very difficult job for them to try and referee um, in the county games anyway. But the amount of uh, spot, the spotlight that was on them, I think, was possibly a small bit unfair. They have uh, obviously a tough job to do. But I do believe that they're, that they're applying a small bit more common sense uh, towards the latter rounds of the league. And look... There's there's a saying that you you wouldn't get that in a championship game, you know, um, for years in the GEA. And I suppose with fans coming back into games now, um, hopefully over the next few weeks as well, 
um, you will see the you will see the free count maybe come down again a small bit more. You know, I think it, it, this kind of happens nearly every year from what I can think of, where there's always something goes on during the league, and then there's a big there's a big discussion about it, and then what well, kind of when it gets to the championship, it kind of gets forgotten about because there's more common sense um, applied during during the championship. I always feel, you know, so I would hope that it it keeps trending that way in terms of in terms of look. The, there's been loads of people coming out, giving out about the amount of frees being given in games. And I, I, I do believe that the majority of people don't want uh, hurling games to, to turn into free-taking contests. I don't think anybody wants that. And as I said, with spectators going back to games, they definitely don't want that as well. Everybody, I will always say, is that a nice free-flowing game of hurling um, is always the best way. You know, I, I always think that a referee has done a great job. If uh, if you can't even remember who's refereeing the game, or if 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 you don't even recognise them when you're on the field, you know. So I think common sense has been applied a small bit more in the last few weeks, and hopefully that'll keep going throughout throughout the rest of the championship. So you would be kind of seen as one of the, the more physically stronger teams, but did you worry? I know John Kiley said it feels like the tackle has changed in a couple of months. We chat and saying, listen, we're going to have to completely change our approach here, even, and you know, we need to because otherwise we we could be giving away twenty frees a match or yeah. Well, we definitely we definitely looked at it uh, after the first game or two that we were giving away too many frees without a doubt. And look, you can blame you can blame everybody by yourselves, but at the end of the day, we we just had to look at ourselves. And realistically, the majority of them were frees against us in the first two games. And I know it was frustrating um, in the in the first kind of couple of games in the league. But realistically, when we went back and actually looked at it, we'd always look at on a Tuesday night after a game, we'd always reflect on the game that we've just played. And realistically. The majority of them were free so uh, the onus was kind of on us to improve improve our tackling efficiency and i think we have done that very well over the last couple of games as i said this is an assumption but i would imagine that our freeze freeze against would have been well down from the first couple of games to the last couple of games in the league so look as i said more common sense has been applied from the referees without a doubt but i do think it, the onus was on us to improve our tackling efficiency as well and i think we have done that and as i said hopefully that keeps going as well good stuff and then the, the kind of connected debate is is it too easy to score these days? I I don't like this argument because I believe that what do like what do fans want? What do I I would imagine that if, when I'm finished up hurling that if you were going to a game you want loads of scores. Like do we want hurling to turn into a defensive sport like football had been in the last few years? I think they're coming out of that now and the, and the emphasis now is more on attacking football. But like if you're at a game and there's 25 scores each or 30 30 scores to whatever a couple two twenty two like that's that sounds like a serious game of hurling to me that sounds a very enjoyable game um to be at to be witnessing as i said we don't want it to turn into a free taking contest i don't think anybody wants that but i don't like the argument does it is it too easy to score nowadays i think the people should should turn it into a positive rather than negative and, and appreciate the the level of score taken and the skill it takes to actually to to to, to take some of these scores in championship games because um, I think the level of hurling and the quality of hurling is is improving all the time, and I think the the quality of players in the game and the quality of games in the last few years has been off the charts. And especially with the introduction of the the round robin, um, I think that's improved the level of the game again, giving more giving players more experience, giving fans more games to go to, so on and so forth. So I think I don't like the argument is it too easy to score. I definitely don't like that argument because I think the the quality of of the game at the moment is 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 absolutely sensational. I suppose one concern is that if it's too easy to score points out the field, nobody will go for goals. But you wouldn't, you don't think that's a something we need to worry about. No, I don't. I don't. I think, I, I think there's, I think there's ebbs and flows, and I think that people can get too zoned in on all they want to do is score points and they don't want to score goals. Believe me, we've in our own team we've talked about definitely trying to add a few more goals to our games. At the end of the day, the goals they they say goals win games. Maybe not so much anymore, but. I do think a couple of goals is definitely something that um, in every game that uh, any team wants to get. You know, so I, I think there's a small bit too much emphasis being put on point taken and all this kind of stuff. At the end of the day, what do spectators want? They want to see interesting, good games with plenty of scores, and I think they're getting that. Um, so, as I said, I don't think there's any need to to change the game of hurling too much. You know. So. I grow to our things, Brian Barry here. Are you right? Um. Playing Cork uh, in a few weeks' time, was it a strange kind of balancing act to get right um, in terms of concentrating on your own preparation when you met them there last week? Or Yeah, I wasn't involved in myself, but I was at the game, obviously, and I was obviously at training in the lead-up to the, to the game. But 
I always say, I always kind of uh, caveat this by saying, I know it's the boring answer, but honestly, we never ever focus on who we're playing. Like, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether you're playing Westmead or Tipperary or Cork or Galway or Waterford, they're, the, they're all the teams we played in the league. We never spend too much time looking at the opposition. We would do a small bit, obviously, of prep on them, but we just focus on ourselves. Um, 95% of the time is focused on getting ourselves right, making sure that we're well prepared, uh, making sure that you're going to train and with full preparation and making sure that you're going to train and giving your all. And honestly, I know it's kind of the boring answer, but that's that's what we do. As I said, we do focus a small bit on the opposition, but the 95, 90, 95% of the, of the preparation before a game is all about making sure that we can we can be the best that we can be, you know, and, uh, and I think that's I think that's a positive um, a positive out- outlook on, on terms of in terms of preparing for a game because um, there's no point worrying about the opposition. You know, you are going to come up against great teams, um, but all you can do is focus on yourself. And if you do that, well, then you give yourself the best chance of of being successful, in my opinion, anyway. And um, I, I personally, I, I really love that. I really love that outlook. Yeah. Um, obviously, that game against Cork it looks like it's going to have a few more fans. So is that a welcome development, obviously? Or... Absolutely. Yeah. Jesus. I think... Uh, the sooner, the sooner we get back to, the sooner we get back to fans being in games again, the better, you know. Um, like, I don't know, there was twenty two and a half thousand people in Wembley yesterday watching England and Croatia, and I know they were smaller, further down the line than we are, but I would hope that, at minimum, that they that they go ahead with what is planned, and, and maybe even they may be able to ramp it up a small bit more. I'm, I'm not sure. As I said, I don't pay too much attention to it because there's so much negatively associated with it, and you're absolutely lynched if you have an opinion on these kind of things, but. Um, I would hope that the minimum requirement, anyway, is what they have was what they have proposed. As I said, as far as I know, that they're they're looking they're looking at getting full attendances uh, in the later stages of the Euros, which has happened well before any later stages of All Ireland. So I would hope that um, we can see decent attendances. I I'm, I'm not expecting full at uh, eighty two thousand people on All Ireland final in a couple of months, but I would hope that we can get decent attendances at games definitely throughout the summer. Has the fact that there's been no crowds there, has it changed anything specific about the games in your opinion? Or? I think it is a bit different, definitely. Yeah. Um, a lot of the emotion on, on game day is definitely not there, as it would be when fans are there for obvious reasons. Um, but realistically, once the ball, like as I kind of mentioned this earlier on, that pre-game and post-game is extremely different, obviously. Um, but once the ball is thrown in, and to be honest, it's, there isn't too much of a difference. Um, not for us, anyway. I don't. I don't feel like we've been affected too. We haven't been obviously affected by it too much, and I don't think the way we play it doesn't it doesn't affect us too much whether there's crowds there or not. But obviously, on a personal level and as a team, we do want fans to get back in the game, uh, to get back at games. But as I said, before the game and after games, it's very very different. Um, but once the ball is thrown in, it's still the same game. It's still fifteen on fifteen with a referee in the middle. It's still the same rules. Not much changes. Yeah. Uh, just last one for me there. I noticed the last few weeks you're the latest convert to bamboo stick. How are you finding it? Or? Yeah, well, in fairness, I've, I've been using Corpy Hurleys for um, for a good few years now, and they're, 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 they're a serious stick, to be fair. And I've been dealing with Sean there, and Sean sent me out a couple of... He sent me out a bamboo last year, all right, and I loved it. And I actually broke it in club championship before we went into the All-Ireland, uh, into the in back with Limerick. Um, actually, Don Don Logrady came out to tackle me. He was we were playing Brandon Ballingary in a, in a relegation final, and he's obviously heard with Limerick for a long time, and he's a selector with us. And he kind of he kind of he hit me a dirty belt, and it kind of broke. Um, but and then he kind of sent me out another one, and I wasn't mad about the, the next one. And obviously, I couldn't call out to him because we were in the middle of a pandemic, so I kind of went back to using the ash. But then at the start of the year this year, he sent me out another one, and uh, and I loved it. And I am I am using them at the moment, and uh, oh, yeah, they're, they're they're lovely and it's. it's I'm always looking for small, small improvements if you can make them. And look, I'm using them at the moment. Not to say I never go back to the ash. I always love something about an ash early that I always love. But there isn't too much of a difference between them in terms of um, strike and, and feel. But there's something about the bamboo that I do really like. And as I said, I'm always very open to, to trying to improve. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Cheers, Gerard. Thanks. Hi, Gerard. Uh, Kevin O'Brien here. Um, I'm just wondering about coming in to this season as hurler of the year. Um, like Austin Gleeson would have spoken in the past that after hurler of the year, he kind of put a bit too much pressure on himself the following couple of seasons. But did your mindset change at all coming into this campaign when you probably will be more of a marked man? Yeah, I suppose that is something that I would have um, that I would have had a conversation with um, with Caroline, our, our sports psychologist, in terms of just trying to just trying to replicate. Uh, 
how I was feeling last year in terms of going into games. I was very kind of laid back, and as I've spoken about it, how I wasn't worrying about wasn't worrying about too much things, and uh, say you didn't get a good night's sleep night for a game or whatever, you know, and just kind of getting back into that, getting back into that mental state where you're just nice and relaxed going into a game, and um, and I, I feel like I, I feel like I'm I'm still in that I'm still in that kind of mindset so far. Obviously, the championship hasn't started yet, and, and time will tell as to as to how we go this year, but um, honestly, I think it's it's just it's just kind of focusing on what's important, you know, just making sure that you're getting the most out of yourself in training on a Tuesday night and a Friday night, making sure you're looking after the gym side of things and your nutrition and your sleep, and after that, just not once all those boxes are ticked, just kind of forgetting about it then until until maybe an hour an hour or two before the game and just having to crack with the lads and trying to enjoy it as much, you know. Um, that's what works for me, as I said, in my in other things obviously work for other players, but that's what I feel uh, works best for me is just kind of relaxing into the game and, and going from there, you know, and um, I would have talked in the past about I'm a, I'm a very reflective person and obviously I would have reflected on last year and what worked for me and what didn't work for me, you know, and obviously I'll try to keep on to what worked for me and, and try and improve on a small few aspects as well, you know, so um, a work in progress. Yeah, and just as a team, like, is there still scope for Limerick to improve? Do you think you're still on an on an upward trajectory? I I think so. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, I think if we were if we were just trying to maintain our position, then it's nearly like a race. If you're just trying to maintain your position, you'll be passed out. You got to keep stretching away from. You got to keep try improving and, and stretching away. Um, and I do absolutely believe that we have we have still a good bit of room for improvement. You look at our league performances so far this year. They've been small, but inconsistent. As I said, we've had a couple of, uh, we've had a loss. Um, we've had, uh, have we two losses? We've two losses, yeah. Um, and obviously a couple of inconsistent performances here and there. So we do absolutely have massive room for improvement. As I said, I'm 27 this summer and I, I'm nearly one of the older members. I am one of the older members on, on, on uh, if you look back at the teams that were starting last year, I'd be one of the I'd probably fourth or fifth oldest. So we still have a lot of young lads on the panel. I still consider myself young. Um, so as I said, we definitely we definitely have room for improvement. You know, I think regardless of who you are, look at I always look at Cristiano, look at look to other other sportsmen and Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi, and they're they're still always improving. They're still beating. They're still improving their their numbers every year in terms of goals scored, so on and so forth, up until their late thirties. So without a doubt, I think we I think without question we have room for improvement. Yeah. Just the last one for me. Um, like you mentioned, some of the younger lads there. There's, you know, the likes of Carl O'Neill, I suppose, there's a bit of excitement around them. What have they added to the setup, the younger lads that have come in the last couple of years? Like, I'd say it's an important thing that you have to always be involved in as a team. You have to have these guys pushing you on. Oh, yeah, they've added serious competition. And that's what drives, that's what drives, um, that's what drives us in training. As, as is obvious, we put a lot of emphasis on our training um, in terms of whoever's going well in training starts, as I just said a few minutes ago. And in fairness, and they're 18, they're, they're, they're both, they're actually doing the leaving cert at the moment. And... They're just they're just a breath of fresh air to be honest. Um, they've, I, 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 in terms of their strength and condition, it's just outrageous for for two young fellas that are sitting there leaving. So they're so they're so far ahead of where I was at eighteen. It's just off the charts in terms of their in terms of what they, the numbers they'd be hitting in the gym and and in fitness tests and things like that. They're just they're they're exceptional young men and. Um, and they're look they're in a great position. I know they're doing their leaving cert at the moment, but when they do rejoin us, whenever that is. Um, uh, we're looking forward to having them back, and as I said, that's what drives us as, as a team. You know, competition from within, fellas putting their hands up in, in league games and in training games before championship. That's what that's what drives us on, and um, and long may it last. You know, and look, there's plenty of there's plenty of other lads at 19 and 20 and 21. Brian O'Grady is, is has had a couple of starts in the league. Mark Quinlan started against Waterford. You know, so that's what you need. You need you need young lads driving you on all the time to to make sure that we are that we are are trying to get better all the time. You know. Cheers, bud. Hi, Grode. How are things? It's Conor McKenna here from Pundit Arena. Grode, um, how did winning the All Ireland in 2018? You had the homecoming in, you know, Connacht in, in uh, Gaelic grounds, even, and it was a big crowd there. Compare with winning the All Ireland last year behind closed doors with Norway homecoming. Yeah, it was, as you can imagine, it was extremely different, Conor. But it was it was nice in a completely different way. That the kind of pressure was off. You know what I mean? We didn't have to be here or be there or be wherever. In 2018, don't get me wrong, it was it was absolutely brilliant. There was all these different homecomings. Monday was in the Gaelic grounds. Tuesday was in the air. Wednesday was somewhere else. Thursday went on for about a week, um, and you kind of, you know, you were kind of half expected to be to be there, you know. And there was, it was a bit taxing. It was. There was no point in saying it wasn't. It was definitely taxing in the months and in the weeks and months after the All Ireland with the different school visits and 
sure if you had the trophy, there was all sorts of different people wanted a photo with you and did, did I forget somebody and so on and so forth. So after 2020 then there was, we weren't even allowed to bring the trophy into the, into the dressing room, not to mind bringing it home with us. So it was extremely difficult, but believe me, it was, it was, it was still very, very um, enjoyable in a completely different way in terms of it, we were just able to kind of relax after the all Ireland. We were just, we were kind of in our own bubble in a few weeks, obviously during the championship, we were in our own bubble in terms of we weren't really mixing with people outside our own bubble. We were doing our best not to be meeting up with friends as, as kind of negative and sad as it sounds because you couldn't really put yourself at risk if you're a close contact, so on and so forth. So we were kind of in our own bubble then for the week, the week or two afterwards as well, which was which was uh, really, really nice as you can imagine also. So yeah, it was extremely different, but it was just as enjoyable and it was much more relaxing. Than it was in 2018, but don't get me wrong. If I had to pick one, it would be 2018. You know, hopefully fans can get back to games and we can get back to that level of emotion and enjoyment and colour and noise that you hear from the stands. So, um, but I think things are looking way more positive now than say maybe this time last year. And Garoda, how does it compare playing the round robin format to the format that would be used this year and last year and that was used before 2017? Yeah, I think the round robin format is is brilliant. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again, ask, ask spectators what do they want, they want to see more games, what do players want, they want more games. So I think the, I think the GA will, without a doubt, go back to the go back to the round robin format. Um, it's nice few extra quid for them as well, I suppose. Um, so I think the, I think we will get back to that, to that format maybe hopefully next year. Um, but look, the, the current the, the championship last year and the championship this year is is fairly intense and it's fairly short. It's actually quite short this year, and there's obviously a short run into it as well from the league. We've only two nights. It's actually probably there's a game the weekend after next, and obviously we're out the weekend after that. So, um, but yeah, look, as I said, it doesn't change too much. We go out, we 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 prepare for every game the same. As I said, we focus on ourselves and we do a small bit on the opposition, but. Um, you just try and go and win every game anyway, so it doesn't really change too much. But um, as I said, hopefully we, we will get back to the Ron Robin series maybe next year. And Rod, you, you heard with St. Patrick's and Rebo there, I think, in the club hurling, but how much has the improvement in City hurling and Limerick had to help Limerick hurling? Yeah, I was actually having a discussion with uh, one of the lads there this morning about, about art school and, and, and schools hurling and colleges hurling. Like, if you look back, I remember growing up 10, 15 years ago, like there wasn't many, I, off the top of my head, I don't think there was any schools Jerome will probably know a bit more than I would, but I don't think there was any schools competing at, at hearty level and there definitely wasn't uh, huge success in UL or LIT. I know they wanted to, they bought one if it's given here and there, but you, you look at the standard of hurling now with Mary I and UL and LIT constantly been at the top table in colleges hurling. The Ard School are, the, are nearly the kingpins of, of the hearty cup and all that feeds through. And then you have your academy, which is obviously well-renowned in Limerick as well. You know, So all that feeds through to the senior panel and I suppose we're lucky that all that planning has gone on over the last number of years and you have the likes of Cahill O'Neill and, and, and Colin Cochran at 18 years old having the, the level of, of S&C done and, and being able to come into a senior panel at their age which I would absolutely not be able to do at 18 years old and, and not alone um, make make a championship panel but actually being able to being able to compete for a starting place in a couple of weeks time you know so it's it's brilliant and I suppose we always I always have to have to thank my lucky stars and I'm just being you know, on, on Limerick panel where I suppose there's so much work going on over the last number of years and we're starting to bear, bear fruits of that now. Good man, Rod. Thanks very much for those. Rod, how are you doing? Shane Stapleton here, are you well? How's it going, Shane? Good. Um, I'm just, you were talking earlier about Carolyn Curd and, you know, sports psychology and, that, and I was just curious about your own path there the last few years because, you know, you had a brilliant 2018, then 2019 you were flying, obviously came back her year in 2020 last year. But, you know, the Kilkenny all Ireland semi-final in 2019 didn't go your team's way, probably personally didn't go your way as well. So I'm just wondering, back to the sports psychology, did you have much self-reflection? Did you feel you needed to do anything or just get back to basics? What, what was that like for you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, no, I didn't change. I didn't change too much, in all honesty, in terms of in terms of the training I was doing or anything like that. Um, I was actually I was listening to a really good podcast there recently about Stephen Gerrard and um, and his kind of career and and he he mentioned something that 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 has stuck with me since and he said he talked about how how a massive failure can actually be the catalyst for um, a period of success or or another massive achievement or or whatever it is and it kind of it's funny like you know you can kind of sink or swim after a defeat like that um, in 2019 you know as a team obviously it was it was devastating and you're you're right on a personal level things didn't go my way that way and it was probably 
uh, it definitely wasn't uh, a successful day in, in a personal sense. But as I said, you can kind of sink or swim after that. You can go back to the drawing board and say, look, we're not good enough and I couldn't really be bothered putting in the work. Or you can go back with the and, and grit your teeth and get on with it and, and hopefully come back with a vengeance. And I, I think we did that in 2020, I suppose. The challenge for us this year then is is to try see if we can if we can replicate that after the year we had in 2020. But um but no, I, I didn't change too much. I didn't change too much. I suppose you kind of have to stick with the process. I know that's kind of a, a, a saying that kind of gets a small bit of stick because it's such a general thing. But if you do stick with what you're doing and, and trust that you are being that you are being coached and led in the right direction and trust that the work you're doing will get you to where you want to, it's it can be a, it can be a powerful thing to, to, to keep doing that over and over again. And it's it's nearly more satisfying then that after a failure like that, even though I was doing kind of the same thing that you come back the following year, even doing the same things, obviously changing a small few bits and pieces here and there. Um, and to have obviously what happened last year is is immense, is immensely um, is immensely enjoyable and, and satisfactory, you know. And if you were to sort of track the, the biggest changes that have happened under John Kiley since he came in before the 2017 season, what, what would you say are the, the most dramatic changes that have been made to take you where you are? I think John is is, is an extremely intelligent man. He's, he's obviously a, a principal of the Abbey School in, in Tipperary, and I think he's 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 smart enough that he has surrounded himself with a, a, an unbelievable um team of coaches around him, you know, in fairness, they've all been well been well talked about and they're all brilliant in their own way. But I, I do believe that that is that we're incredibly lucky we are incredibly lucky as as a group of players to have such exposure to such a high level high level coaching team, you know, the likes of they've all you, you've heard of them all at this stage, you know, but like we're not we're not we're not left wanting for anything, you know, in terms of feedback, whether that be on your individual performance or, or on the team performance or coaching um you can always look for feedback off of any of the coaches it's not just paul you know he's paul has a very good uh, group of coaches with him as well so i just i just think that that we are that we are lucky to be to be involved in such a in such a high performance uh high profile setup it's kind of funny i was again on another podcast rio ferdinand uh he was talking about when he, he left united and went to qpr and how he was so shocked about um about how they how they how they how they train day to day and the stuff they were talking about in the dress room and how they how they just acted and how they performed as as professionals. How he, he was such a, he was so used to playing with United for 10, 15 years and and their ways and the way they went about things. And then he left and went to QPR and he thought he'd be kind of getting the same exposure. But he wasn't obviously he wasn't anywhere near the professional setup that United was. And I just I just kind of struck me again that we are lucky to be involved in such a high profile or such a high performance setup and as I said, um, yeah, and as I said, that's that's kind of we're kind of lucky on our part, you know. And just a, a final one then for me. Um, I think when teams start winning all Irelands, as you've uh, had, I suppose part of the motivation then is to leave a legacy, that type of stuff. I don't think Limerick have done back to back in their history. So, is there a talk of doing legacy to some degree, or that's probably not something that you're going to say publicly anyway? Oh, honestly, we we haven't talked about we haven't talked about anything like that at all. I suppose at the end of the day, like you, you have to remember that, like I'm, I'm 26, and as I said, I'm nearly one of the older, older panel members uh, on the team, and like we've so many young players, we've two 18 year olds sitting there leaving. So do you think they're talking about legacy? They're not. You know, there's nobody talking about legacy in our camp. Uh, we just, as I said, I just honestly believe that if you have a mindset of trying to be the best you can be and trying to get the most out of yourself, but then see where that takes you. So you can talk about legacy in 10, 15 years' time. You're sitting at the bar having a pint of Guinness. Talking to other outlets around the pub, there'll be plenty of time to talk about that in time. But as you can imagine, we have two 18 year olds sitting in the Leaving Cert at the moment, so you can imagine that there, that there most certainly isn't any legacy talk out of our out of our camp, you know. So um, leave that to other people; they can talk about what they want. You know, that's that's something that we maybe can talk about when we're when we're retired and uh, um, down the line, you know. So we'll we'll see we'll see where that gets us. Cheers, Grod. Uh, lads, I'm just conscious of time here. We might take one last question for Garrod, if that's all right, and we'll have to switch the lads over. Gar- Garrod, I just wanted to ask you about, you're playing Cork again in a couple of weeks. Uh, do you think they were trying to lull you into a false sense of security, maybe, with the last the last day? I don't know. They might have been. I don't know. I, I, I'm not obviously in their, in their camp. I, I know they, they had a couple of, couple of lads that will probably be playing against us in a couple of weeks that we weren't playing. Um, it will it will be a different ball game in a few weeks time. There's no point in saying it won't. We're not we're not um, we're not we're not believing that because we won the last day we'll win again uh, easily the next time or it'll be even the same kind of game you know. So um, 
it'll be interesting without a doubt. Uh, we've had some great games against them over the last number of years, and and um, I think they've actually looked really, really good in the in the, some of the. I haven't watched much of the league this year, but anything I've, anything I've seen from them, they've been they've been excellent um, and very, very dangerous looking on the attack. So um, I'm sure Saturday Saturday two weeks time will be will be very, very interesting.